It's often stated that you have to beat the man to be the man. This is generally the case, but if you dig through the annals of boxing history, one man defies said logic. He's a fighter that was embraced for losing instead of gaining victory. In those losses, his legend continued to grow. He's a man who would earn the nickname Iron Man due to his unmatched ability to withstand punishment in the ring along with being nearly impossible to knock out. His name is Joe Grimm. Author Michael Winkler once wrote, Joe Grimm reminds us where the bounds of normal are drawn and stand conspicuously and spectacularly outside that compass, without obstacle, without evasion, without contradiction. Saverio Gianone was born on March 16, 1881 in Avellino, Campania, Italy, and at age 10, his family migrated to the United States. He would ultimately reside in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. If you watched our video on the great Harry Lewis, another Philly boxing legend, you know that Philly fighters are tough and crafty as it's one of the premier fight cities in the history of boxing. For Grimm, he stands out even among Philly fighters in a way unlike any other. At 17 years of age, he adopted the name Joe Grimm and from there established the boot black stand where he would polish boots and shoes. The stand was close to the Broadway Athletic Club in Philadelphia, and at some point after filling in for an unavailable fighter, Grimm realized he could make more money fighting a proposition he viewed as reasonable. Standing around 5, 7 and a half and generally weighing no more than 150 pounds, Grimm would compete from welterweight to heavyweight, and an ironclad chin made this possible as he was far from what one would call skilled. The Ring Magazine founder, Nat Fleischer, was quoted as describing Grimm's abilities as follows. Grimm could neither box nor punch, but he possessed an abundance of courage, in fact, too much for his own good. He was slow on his feet and even slower in his thought process. Though he had none of the assets that go to make a good fighter, for many years, he was a great drawing card only because of his staying powers and his raw courage. His ability to absorb punishment was incomparable. Some people laugh in the face of danger, but in the case of Grimm, he laughed in the face of taking a beating. He would routinely urge his opponents to give him more damage as the pain was but an endorphin. He would laugh any type of punch off and continue to charge forward. The self-dubbed Italian champion would kick off his boxing career in Philadelphia on June 26, 1899, opening with a draw. This verdict would soon be much appreciated over his career as he would become accustomed to battling several of the greatest boxers the sport has ever seen and had the scars to prove it. It wouldn't take long for his competition to rise as on September 15, 1900, Grimm would clash with an underrated lightweight with wins over the likes of Sam Langford and Jack Blackburn who would go on to be one of his greatest rivals, Dave Holly. Grimm would be disqualified in the fourth of the sixth round contest. Grimm and Dave Holly would be back in the ring on October 22nd, fighting to a six round draw in what was described as a wild fight. In the month between their fight, Grimm had already fought an additional three times, including two days prior. Fast forward to March of 1902. Grimm and Dave Holly would meet on March 6th, with Holly winning a six round newspaper decision before the two men drew on March 20th. At this point, Grimm had amassed a record of 19, 18, and 9 since turning pro, willing to fight any comers, regardless of standing in the sport. Grimm would then move into back-to-back -back contests with welterweight Cub White, a local Philly fighter who faced the likes of Jeff Clark and Harry Lewis in his career, losing six-round point decisions on September 13th and September 26th. On November 18th, Grimm would drop a six-round decision to the underrated George Cole before dropping another six-round decision to Cole on December 9th. Grimm would kick off 1903 with a January 8th matchup with Hall of Fame former World Light Heavyweight Champion Philadelphia Jack O'Brien, one of Philly's most famous fighters. Grimm made a bet that O'Brien wouldn't be able to stop him in six rounds. True to his word, Grimm would lose a six-round decision without being stopped. On February 27th, Grimm would meet the former world welterweight title challenger, Charlie McKeever, a fighter with wins over young Griffo and George Kidd Levine. McKeever would win via points over six rounds. 
after rematching George Cole on May 19th, dropping another six-round decision, Grimm would step in with the tough and well-traveled former middleweight title challenger, Kid Carter, on June 23rd. Carter defeated such men as Barbados Joe Walcott, Joe Chawinski, and Charles Kid McCoy, to name a few. It was reported that Carter gave Grimm a beating, doing most of his work to the body and unable to drop Grimm. Despite such, at the end of six rounds, Grimm didn't have a mark on his face and body and looked as fresh as ever. On July 15th, Grimm would step in with the Hall of Famer and one of Ireland's greatest fighters in the Irish giant, Peter Marr. Scheduled for six rounds, the two started things slow, with Grimm opting to fight a cautious fight in the first. In the second, Meyer landed a huge right that nearly sent Grimm to the canvas, though he was able to avoid so by holding on to Meyer's neck. Looking to press the action, Grimm rushed Meyer in the third, and while swinging with wild shots, hit Meyer low, sending him to the canvas in agony. Once in his corner, Meyer was unable to continue and was awarded the DQ victory on an accidental low blow. While Meyer was still sitting in his corner, a spectator made a remark about him having quit. Meyer certainly turned and punched the man in the face, knocking him unconscious. This sent the crowd into an uproar and disorder ensued. The police were able to convene quickly and cleared the location. Grimm's next fight would be on September 12th, where he took on the Hall of Fame former world welterweight champion and one of the greatest fighters in history, the Barbados demon Joe Walcott. Walcott would floor Grimm once, but he took the damage well. Grimm wasn't badly hurt as Walcott won the decision over six rounds. In his next contest, just a month later, on October 14th, Grimm would take on the first ever three-division world champion and arguably boxing's greatest puncher, the fighting blacksmith, Ruby Robert, aka Bob Fitzsimmons. With it widely known that Grimm had never been knocked out at this point, there was a ton of interest in whether or not Fitzsimmons would be the first man to do so. To say that Joe Grimm took a beating would be an understatement. Though there were varying reports as far as the number of times Grimm was dropped, Fitzsimmons would send Grimm to the canvas between 17 and 20 times over the six round contest. Fitzsimmons even landed his solar plexus punch on numerous occasions, which had little effect on Grimm's body. And still, Joe Grimm remained on his feet at the end of the fight as Fitzsimmons claimed the points victory. After the contest, Joe Grimm was held as a man without a solar plexus. In his next fight, which I kid you not, was five days later, on October 19th, Grimm would face one of the greatest boxers of all time and a man considered to be the greatest lightweight of all time, the old master, Joe Gans. There was a pre-fight agreement in place that were Gans unable to knock out Grimm within six rounds, Gans would have to forfeit his entire purse. Gans would batter Grimm all over the ring, dropping him in every round, multiple times in some rounds. In the end though, Grimm would prove why his name rang bells across the sport as Gans was unable to stop him and won the newspaper decision on points. With bigger goals in mind, Grimm would set his sights on the biggest prize in boxing, the World Heavyweight Championship, then held by the Boilermaker James J. Jeffries. Grimm issued an open challenge to Jeffries with heavy financial backing in Philadelphia to prove that even boxing's top heavyweight couldn't put Grimm down for the count. In response to the repeated inquiries, Jeffries would have the following to say regarding the matchup. I am sure if I ever did meet Grimm, I would stop him. I would not joke with him like Fitzelman's did. I would sail right in at the sound of the bell to put him out and I am confident he would go out before the contest had gone far. I will not fight him, however, and the matchmakers might just as well give up all thoughts of ever inducing me to agree to such a one-sided match. Two fights later, to open up his 1904 season, Grimm would have a return bout with Joe Gans in Baltimore, Maryland on January 22nd. The bout was scheduled for 10 rounds. With Grimm being dubbed the human punching bag, Gans would agree to another pre-fight agreement that if he wasn't able to knock Grimm out in six rounds, he would forfeit his purse, plus have to pay an additional $100 for each remaining round that Grimm stayed standing. Gans beat Grimm to a bloody pulp. 
blasting him with hard shots throughout, while Grimm barely managed to land any punch of note. This was reported to have been the worst beating that Grimm had ever received thus far in his career. Miraculously, Grimm remained standing at the end of the 10 rounds. Grimm finished bloodied with a smashed nose, cuts and bruises all about his face, as well as swelling in nearly every part of his head where he was hit. Grimm did walk away with the entirety of the purse though. On February 18th, Grimm would drop a six round decision to the battle-tested heavyweight contender, Jim Jeffords. Grimm would then draw with Owen Ziegler in a six round contest on February 29th. Exactly one month later, on March 29th, Grimm would be back in with old foe Dave Holly in a six-rounder, again losing via decision. This led to a matchup with former world welterweight champion Matty Matthews on April 16th. In a rare victory and what was considered a major upset, Joe Grimm would be in rare form as he picked up a six-round newspaper decision win. After going back to his losing ways for a few fights, on May 7th, Grimm would have a return bout with the Irish giant Peter Maher. Maher gave Grimm a drubbing, though in the fifth round, Grimm took the offensive, landing a number of wild shots cleanly on Maher. Just before making the rush, Grimm had yelled out, Hey Peter, the crowd in attendance was misconstrued and thought that Grimm had yelled, Hey Quitter, which caused a brief commotion at ringside. In the end, Maher would win the decision after six. Grimm's next fight would be another six round points loss to Dave Holly on June 6th. On September 21st, Grimm would drop a six round decision to the controversial former world welterweight champion Dixie Kidd. This led to a six round decision loss against the underrated Larry Temple on September 30th, before again dropping a six rounder to Dixie Kidd on October 3rd. Up next was a three fight series with one of the most underrated boxers of all time in Chappie. Jack Blackburn. The first fight took place on November 3rd. Grimm was game as he put up resistance against Blackburn to start things. In the fifth round, Blackburn landed a short right that was considered the hardest punch Grimm had ever received, which opened up a nasty gash on his right eye and sent him to his knees. Blackburn followed up with a shot that sent Grimm flat on his back to the canvas. Somehow, Grimm was able to answer the count though on wobbly and staggering legs. Hell bent on gaining a knockout, Blackburn would go all out as he beat Grimm from pillar to post. It was so bad that the police tried to intervene. Upon seeing this, Grimm started to fight back with reckless aggression in order to show that he was still in the fight. The bell then sounded saving Grimm. The minute rest did wonders as in the sixth and final round, Grimm looked as fresh as ever as he remained standing at the end, though in another losing effort. The two would meet again on December 1st with Grimm taking a beating throughout the six rounds, dropping another decision. Grimm would kick off 1905 in a January 12th trilogy with Jack Blackburn. Through the first four rounds, Blackburn had Grimm holding on for dear life, nullifying some of his offense. In the final two rounds, Blackburn turned up the heat as he beat Grimm all over the ring. Grimm finished the contest bloody from head to toe, but again remained standing. On February 17th, Grimm would again face Dixie Kidd. Confident of being able to stop Grimm, Dixie Kidd was nearly knocked out himself in the sixth and final round of the contest, though he managed to escape with a draw. On July 24th, Grimm would step in with one of the greatest heavyweights in boxing history, the Galveston giant Jack Johnson. Betting odds were 2-1 to one that Johnson would not be able to knock out Grimm within the scheduled sixth round. This ultimately proved true, though Grimm took a serious beating. Johnson dropped Grimm a reported 20 times. Blood was all over Grimm, Johnson, the ring, and most spectators close to the ring. After each knockdown, Grimm would return to his feet smiling, though he had taken the count to nine several times. As 1906 rolled around, Grimm would drop a three-round decision at the hand of soldier Burke on January 24th. Burke defeated Billy Papke, among other notable fighters in his career. Grimm and Burke would meet again on May 21st in New York. History would be made on this occasion as Soldier Burke was credited with becoming the first man to force Grimm to take a 10 count, picking up the knockout victory in the third round after dropping Grimm multiple times. Additionally, at the end of the match, the police intervened and arrested seven of the principals in the matchup, including Joe Grimm and Soldier Burke. 
Everyone was held on a $500 bond. Three days later, the case was thrown out after the magistrate found out that one of the police officers had recently become a club member and when witnessing the character of the fight caused a raid to be made. Due to the lack of evidence, everyone was discharged. In a 1936 interview with Jack Cuddy of the United Press, Grimm had the following to say with regards to Soldier Burt being the first man to knock him out. When I went down in the third round, somebody turned off the lights in the house while I was on the canvas. I was up on my feet at the count of three, looking for Burke in the dark. By the time the lights was turned on the referee had counted me out. Gamblers had arranged the whole thing. They cleaned up. But I wasn't knocked out. If you're enjoying this, please give us a like and share as we want to get this story out to even more audience. Grimm and Burke would have a trilogy match a month later on June 21st with Burke gaining a lopsided points victory. On July 12th, Grimm would take a drubbing in a six round points loss to the battle hardened Joe Thomas, a fighter with wins over the likes of Frank Kloss and Harry Lewis in his career. Grimm's next notable fight was his first in 1907 when on February 7th, he took on a fighter with a very tough resume in George Gunther. Grimm actually put up what was considered to be his best performance as he and Gunther fought a rapid pace six rounds. Gunther's speed and jolting right kept Grimm honest and though it was of the view of those in attendance that Gunther had the better of the contest, the fight was ultimately ruled a draw. A week later on February 14th, Grimm would drop a six-round decision to the well-traveled Terry Martin in a tough but clear victory for Martin. Grimm's next two contests would be an April 4th six-round decision loss to Sailor Burke, followed by another six-round points loss to Terry Martin on June 5th. After that, on September 3rd, Grimm would drop a decision to the tough and capable Jim Barry, another fighter with a very tough resume. After starting 1908 with a win and a loss, on May 12th, Grimm would step in with former world heavyweight title challenger Al Kaufman dropping a six-round decision. From here, the fight pace started to slow down for Grimm, who while still remaining game and tough, had sustained recurring punishment for the better part of 10 years, and while he was an Iron Man, even iron deteriorates and becomes rust-ridden over time. To this point, the overwhelming majority of Grimm's fights had taken place in Philadelphia. Now it was time to take his talents, or lack thereof, across the world to Australia. Grimm would go 0, 8, and 3 during his Australian run, which lasted from October 5, 1908 to December 11, 1909. He also managed to get a shot at the Tasmania State Heavyweight title for what it's worth. His next stop in country was France where on June 5, 1910, he ran into one of the best heavyweights of all time and former colored world heavyweight champion, the Oxnard Cyclone Sam McVeigh. In the 13th of a scheduled 20 rounds, McVeigh was reported to have become the second man to stop Joe Grimm, but it's unclear whether he went down for the count. Grimm would fight on through 1913, suffering a six-round points loss to Philadelphia-born former World Light Heavyweight Champion Battling Levitsky on January 11, 1912. Afterwards, he was knocked out in his final fight of his career by Joe Burrell, a tough Philly fighter, on July 22, 1913. Joe Grimm would finish his career with an official record of 17 victories, 33 losses, and 6 draws. 15 of his wins came via KO in 122 no decision bouts along with one no contest. When factoring in the no decision verdicts common during the era due to laws and regulations, Grimm's career record is a whopping 40 victories, 112 losses, and 25 draws. An insane stat line mostly for all the wrong reasons. 77 of his fights were in Philadelphia. If we pull back the layers, it can be argued that Joe's handlers and promoters took advantage of a man who himself was defenseless. While he can surely be commended for his bravery and otherworldly ability to take punishment, the long-term effects of taking such brutal and sustained physical trauma would not end well. It is estimated that Joe Grimm participated in between 300 and 400 fights, many unreported. It's virtually impossible to quantify the damage received in his unreported fights coupled with those we know of. 
After Grimm's fight with Bob Fitzsimmons in October of 1903, several studies were conducted to try and understand why he was able to take such punishment over his career. No explanations were provided and nothing definitively materialized outside of the mention of potential hidden nerve centers. On July 28, 1913, Grimm was admitted to a sanatorium in Norristown, Pennsylvania and eventually discharged as he was considered cured of his mental problems. Much like even the greatest boxers, when the lights go out and you're no longer in the spotlight and ultimately of use, so does the backing and the fanfare. If not for family and friends, most boxers end up alone. Grimm became a shipyard foreman in New York around 1919. Still, he was said to be mentally and financially broken before his death 20 years later in a hospital at Byberry, Pennsylvania. Not quite the fairy tale ending for a man who gave everything he had to the sport of boxing. These days, guys like Joe Grimm rarely get mentioned as most boxing fans, much like anything modern, have so many options that it's easy for one to fade into oblivion. One thing is for sure certain, all wins and losses are not created equal. The barbaric career of Joe Grimm, boxing's true Iron Man, was aided by a thirst for barbaric entertainment. I've even asked myself whether I'd be entertained by such brutality that Joe Grimm was subjected to in a sport that's already brutal. As a boxing official, a part of me says no, as I have compassion for the fighter, but the Marine in me says a victory by any means is still a victory. Please share your thoughts in the comments on whether you believe Joe Grimm was a victor in the sense that he got the opportunity to make money doing something he must surely have grown to love, or do you think he was a victim of the greed for financial gain in boxing? Either way, thanks for watching and sharing your opinions on the matter. Have a good one.